In 1700, the first publication of Reflections emerged, prompted, as suggested by the prefatory advertisement, by a book that had only recently come to the author's attention. This book was undoubtedly the translations of the proceedings of the infamous Mazarin divorce case referenced in Astell's subtitle. In the initial sentences of the first edition, Astell candidly states, Curiosity, having induced me to read the account of an unhappy marriage, I thought an afternoon would not be quite thrown away in pursuing such reflections as it occasioned. This seemingly innocent beginning belies the incendiary content that follows. Indeed, the anonymous author, perhaps to exonerate herself, claims in the advertisement that she has no other design than to correct some abuses, which are not the less because power and prescription seem to authorize them. On the opening page of the fourth edition, Astell further protests. I am so far from designing a satire upon marriage, as some pretend, either unkindly or ignorantly, through want of reflection in that sense wherein I use the word. Nonetheless, Astell's work undeniably critiques the customs and moralities governing early 18th century marriage, using the Mazarin divorce as a convenient pretext. The 18th century marked a revolutionary era in the history of matrimony. In England, long-standing contractual and transactional conventions began to be renegotiated within public discourse. Previously sacrosanct topics were openly debated and reconsidered, leading to a shift in the traditional legal subjugation of wives as mere chattels. The century commenced with a real-life scandal permeating both fictional and non-fictional literature, initiating the 18th-century re-evaluation of marital terms. Hortense Mancini, Duchess of Mazarin, fled to England to evade her husband's authority, citing grounds including sexual perversion. King Charles II of England granted her a substantial pension, which she used to indulge in a lifestyle as debauched as the accusations she had made against her husband. It was not the depravity itself but the issue of the husband's unquestioned authority that inspired Mary Astell to publish her provocative and pioneering essay Some Reflections Upon Marriage in 1700. Purportedly composed in a single afternoon, Astell's essay argues that the contemporary framework of marriage was a trap, stripping women of all claims to equality and leaving them with no legal recourse to escape. Marriage conventions were not built on true partnership but were designed to perpetuate myths of gender inferiority. Astell posits that women would fare better seeking guidance within themselves or from God to attain happiness and improve their lives. She practiced what she preached, never marrying herself. Astell did not oppose marriage as a conceptual union under God, whom she believed envisioned marriage as a perfect reflection of his wisdom and judgment. The problem, she argued, lay in human corruption of this divine ideal. In traditional marriage, choice resided almost entirely with the husband. He could easily change his mind before the ceremony, facing minor consequences, whereas women faced an either or decision, accept the proposal or risk remaining a spinster. Acceptance guaranteed inequality and submission to an unjust system. Astell blamed part of marriage's sorry state on the lack of educational opportunities for women. She suggested that if women were raised with ambitions beyond securing a husband, they would be more discerning. Poor choices in marriage, she argued, stemmed from low self-esteem and competition among women, which prevented them from recognizing their own worth. Despite her criticism of systemic gender inequality, 
Astel maintained that a wife should remain loyal to her husband. This belief mirrored her monarchist view that subjects should remain loyal to their sovereign, extending this loyalty to the marital relationship. Astel acknowledges the necessity of divorce in compelling circumstances. There are some reasons, for the laws of God and man allow divorces in certain cases, though not many, that authorize a wife's leaving her husband. However, if anything short of absolute necessity, arising from irreclaimable vice and cruelty, compels her to break these sacred and strongest bonds, she is exposed to temptations, injuries, contempt, and the just censure of the world. In situations where a woman suffers disdain and degradation from her husband, divorce becomes justifiable, for in such cases, she cannot sustain the inherent value of matrimony. Affection and disdain are mutually exclusive, thus, a husband who truly loves his wife would not subject her to agony once they are wed. When couples can no longer uphold their marital vows, it is commendable for them to divorce rather than persist in a marriage founded on insincerity. Marriage should be based on mutual consent and free will rather than coercion. They only who have felt it know the misery of being forced to marry where they do not love. Of being yoked for life to a disagreeable person and imperious temper, where ignorance and folly the ingredients of a coxcomb, who is the most insufferable fool, tyrannize over wit and sense. To be perpetually contradicted for contradiction's sake, and overborne by authority, not by argument. To be denied one's most innocent desires for no other reason than the absolute will and pleasure of a lord and master, whose follies a wife, with all her prudence, cannot hide and whose commands she cannot but despise even as she obeys them. Coercing an individual into marriage is akin to imposing an untenable yoke upon the heart. Instead of appreciating the joys of matrimony, the individual becomes embittered by the mere sight of a partner whom they do not love. Therefore, marriage is a mutual contract that necessitates the genuine consent of both parties. Enduring an involuntary marriage results in perpetual anguish, thus, individuals should not be pressured into marriage without genuine enthusiasm. The primary forces encouraging women to endure marriages are religion and reputation. Religion and reputation are so sure a guard, such a security to poor defenseless woman, that whenever a man has ill designs on her, he is sure to breach one or both of these. By endeavoring either to corrupt her principles, to make her less strict in devotion, or to lessen her value of a fair reputation, he would persuade her that less than she imagines will secure her in the next world, and that not much regard is to be given to the censures of this. Devout women bear the affliction of maltreatment through unwavering dedication to their husbands. Consequently, religion can be detrimental to a woman's happiness, particularly when it imposes irrational standards upon her. Furthermore, women conscious of their reputation will do whatever it takes to ensure their marriages remain intact. Such women would sacrifice their own happiness to protect their social standing. Let's now look at some of the motifs and symbols used by Astel. Wounds serve as metaphors for the tribulations women endure within their marriages. A woman who seeks consolation under domestic troubles from the gaieties of a court, from gallantry, gaming, rambling in search of odd adventures, childish, ridiculous and ill-natured amusements, such as we find in the unhappy Madame M.S. memoirs, the common methods of getting rid of time, 
that is, of our very being, and keeping as much as we can at a distance from ourselves, will find these are very insignificant applications. They hardly skin the wound, and can never heal it, they even hurt, they make it fester, and render it almost incurable. The soothing of these wounds is unmanageable due to the omnipresent complications endured throughout their marriages. Wounds attest that bliss is not a guarantee for all women. Those nursing the sores of marriage cannot be explicitly gratified. Beauty conceals the internal weaknesses and distresses of women. What an ill figure does a woman make, with all the charms of her beauty and sprightliness of her wit, with all her good humor and insinuating address. Though she be the best economist in the world, the most entertaining company, if she remit her guard, abate in the severity of her caution and strictness of her virtue. If she neglects those methods which are necessary to keep her, not only from a crime, but from the very suspicion of one. For a woman, being stunning does not grant immunity from marital challenges that are common in matrimonies. Her loveliness makes it difficult for outsiders to speculate that her marriage could be enduring woes. A woman bears the utmost responsibility in her marriage, as she is expected to uphold virtues more than the man. She justifies the injury her husband has done her, by publishing to the world that whatever good qualities she may possess, discretion, the mistress of all the rest, is wanting. Though she be really guiltless, she cannot prove her innocence, the suspicions in her prejudice are so strong. When she is censured, charity, that thinks no evil, can only be silent. Though it believes and hopes the best, it cannot engage in her defense, nor apologize for irregular actions. Virtue is what qualifies a woman as an exemplary wife. An honorable woman endeavors to uphold her husband's reputation, even when she is aware that he has a mistress. Her discretion is essential in maintaining the sustainability of her marriage. Astel elucidates, curiosity, which is sometimes an occasion of good, but more frequently of mischief, by disturbing our own or our neighbor's repose. Having induced me to read the account of an unhappy marriage, I thought an afternoon would not be quite thrown away in pursuing such reflections as it occasioned. I am far from designing a satire upon marriage, as some pretend, either unkindly or ignorantly, through want of reflection in that sense wherein I use the word. Astel asserts that her inquisitiveness serves as the impetus for the reflections she has concerning marriage. These interpretations influence the conclusions she draws regarding the institution of marriage. She observes, or, suppose on the other hand, she has married the man she loves, heaped upon him the highest obligations, by putting into his power the fortune he coveted, the beauty he professed to adore, how soon are the tables turned? It is her part now to court and fawn, his real or pretended passion soon cools into indifference, neglect, or perhaps aversion. Tease well if he preserves a decent civility, takes a little care of appearances, and is willing to conceal his breach of faith. The figurative breach of faith signifies the man's betrayal, a violation of the vows they took to remain unequivocally loyal. Astel expounds, Devotion is the proper remedy, and the only infallible relief in all distresses. When this is neglected or turned into ridicule, we run, as from one wickedness, so from one misfortune, to another. Unhappy is that grandeur which is too great to be good, and that which sets us at a distance from true wisdom. Even bigotry, 
as contemptible as it is, is preferable to profane wit. For that requires our pity, but this deserves our abhorrence. Unwavering commitment to marriage forms a robust foundation that ensures a couple's longevity. Steadfast couples embrace inherent strength, enabling them to navigate the obstacles characteristic of marriage.